There's no grander structure made out of a solid piece of granite in the world than the Alexander Column in St. Petersburg. Weighing some 600 tons, measuring almost 26 meters in length, it was completed in 1834. In the previous film, we mentioned the Scottish engineer Alexander MacDonald with his granite factory in Aberdeen, who, by the 1830s, had only just learned how to work with granite in an economically feasible way with the aid of steam machines and tools made out of hardened steel. He was a pioneer in this field. Before him, working with granite meant using manual tools, which was considered unprofitable. As a result, fine granite work, for example polishing, wasn't done by anyone in Europe before the 19th century. Until then, granite was only used for rough work. Rough blocks used for foundations, bridges, aqueducts, and paving stones. The technique used to make these blocks was to simply break down larger blocks into smaller size blocks. But at the very same time in St. Petersburg, inside the Kazan Cathedral, there already stood the 56 exquisitely polished granite columns produced in 1811 by Alexander MacDonald's colleague, the mason sculptor Samson Sukunow who, according to an 1834 source, had taken the method of breaking granite to extreme simplicity and ease. Thanks to his clever and secret methods, he was soon whipping out granite columns weighing many tons like they were just so many sausages. Of course, we cannot rule out the possibility that Sukunel was simply a craftsman or foreman who got saddled with the authorship of half of St. Petersburg early 19th century granite works. While the true developer of the mysterious method of simply and easily breaking down granite could have been a completely different person, a professional chemist and mineralogist. One such person admitted into the secret of St. Petersburg granite may have been the Russian Academy of Sciences member Germain Ivanovich Hess. In the brochure on the use of granite in St. Petersburg, by the way, it was published in the year that construction of the Alexander Column was completed, the opinion of Academy member Hess concerning the properties of red Finland granite, out of which the column was made, is stated as follows. Academy member Hess, based on a remark by Mischtierlich, meaning the German chemical scientist Eilhard Mischtierlich, that the axles of crystals increase or decrease in length with increases or decreases in temperature, supposes that granite that consists of crystal grains breaks down more conveniently than smaller grain granite. And further on, it continues. They said that when large grain Finland granite is broken down, sometimes a strong crackling sound is emitted, similar to the sound produced by a gunpowder explosion. Crumbling and sometimes nearly loose granite, primarily containing lotolite, is known by the name Rapakivi in Finland. Granite like this also occurs in the environs of St. Petersburg, sometimes as large boulders whose constituent materials are almost completely unconnected to each other and are easily separated by hand. End of quotation. Rapakivi means rotten stone in Finnish, and it is out of this very rotten stone that the Alexander Column is carved. Obviously, the granite column was not carved, but produced in another way. Montferrand's drawings purporting to show the columns being carved in situ in a quarry can be dismissed as fantasies dreamt up to safeguard the secret of St. Petersburg granite. Best let everyone imagine it's natural. Academy member Hess isn't even hinting, but rather saying directly that the large grain Rapakivi granite separates into crystal grains more conveniently than other type or kind of granite. So here is the solution to St. Petersburg granite from the second half of the 18th century and practically the whole of the 19th century. It was not used in its natural form, as created by nature itself, since there were no tools yet for its fine processing, but as a raw material for obtaining crystal grains, out of which artificial granite was subsequently produced. While the simple and easy method of breaking granite probably consisted of it first being heated, which Academy member Hess talks about, and then quickly cooled, for example, poured over with cold water, or put out in the cold frosty air, due to which it exploded with a strong crackling sound like a gunpowder explosion. By the way, granite is a foreign word in the Russian language, 
and before it, a different word was used. Dresvianic. Let's read from the Russian Academy's 1809 Dictionary, published, Dresvianic, a stone that can be conveniently turned into Dresva, and Dresva, parts of a natural stone that has fallen apart due to burning or air. In other words, at the beginning of the 19th century in Russia, the word granite was used for a stone that easily falls apart into its constituent crystal grains. This was precisely its main useful quality for people at that time. And now, it's the right time to talk about the Alexander Column's older sister. This drawing depicts five of the tallest triumphal columns in the world as of 1836. Two of them are made out of granite. The Alexander Column, with a total height of nearly 34 meters, and Pompeii's pillar in Egyptian Alexandria, 27 meters, which is not small either. This is what Thomas Salmon, then a relatively well-known English writer, historian, and geographer, whose work was published in various European languages, this is his Dutch edition, said about this column. The body of the column is a whole chunk of granite or marble or a mixture that is a match for marble in durability and beauty. And then he expresses his astonishment that such a large and heavy monstrosity, as he called this column, could have been transported by people either on land or by sea. Indeed, such was his astonishment that he doubted it was transported anywhere at all, and explains its origins in the following way, word for word. This gives us reason to think that the ancients, especially the Egyptians, knew how to mold and imitate stone exceeding the very best marble that nature provides. True, this is only the opinion of a historian and geographer, but it was based on something after all. Perhaps the external appearance of the column prompted his doubts. Or Egyptian stone dishware gave him reason to think that if the Egyptians capable of imitating natural stone in small things, in dishware for example, what prevented them from doing the same thing with large objects? For example, producing a column or obelisk that looked as though it was made out of natural granite. By the way, as mentioned in the previous film, it's quite possible that Thomas Salmon had seen Egyptian stone dishware in Europe, the destination for much of Egypt's exported dishware in the 19th century. So we have the two largest columns in the world made out of solid chunks of granite, both suspected of having been made from artificial granite. Note that the description of the Alexander Column and other granite objects in St. Petersburg out of the Red Finland Granite Rapakivi is accompanied by the remark that this type of granite separates into grains most conveniently. All that remains is to find out how these grains were combined anew in such a way that the artificial reconstituted granite looks just like natural granite, which is exactly what we are going to talk about in the next film.